So, a quick summary, please understand where we are heading, all right? Now, where we are heading is constantly to remind ourselves that what is the best way to cultivate godliness? Godliness, in the first place, is defined as one who is desiring to be like God, who has God-like qualities, like Christ. And the quality that we want to learn from Christ is Christ's loving obedience towards the Father. All right? Godliness always involves the heart towards God. That was the problem with the children of Israel during Malachi's time. They did a lot of things outwardly, but God says, I, that was the time when God says, I need to find godly seed because there are, it is absent among you. You are doing things, but there is no love in your heart for me. You are not godly just because you do these things. All right? The best place to learn to have a heart towards God, where? The first ten commandments, uh, the first five commandments, which is, Summarized as, well, the summary is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind. That is where we learn to love God. Right? The commandments is where we learn to love God. So teens, every time you look at the commandments, you must look at it and say, I am doing this because it's training me to love God. Don't resist it. When daddy and mommy tells me to obey this and that commandment, always remember, Commandments are training my heart to love God. And parents, when you use the Word of God to guide and to train your child, aim at the heart. I'm not saying just because the heart doesn't want, then you don't get them to obey. But you must know how. You pray for wisdom. You must know how to get the child to do those things and develop that love for God in their heart. Now, maybe i give you another example. Your child doesn't like mathematics. I didn't like mathematics because I was not good at it. That is why I didn't like it. It stresses me. I don't know how to do it. I, I just didn't want to do it. Now, but parents who know that it, if it is important, you must develop in your child a love for the subject, right? So, well, like many of you, my parents, found me an extremely good mathematics tuition teacher. Mathematics suddenly became so easy, so fun, because I knew how to do it. But initially, I really bucked against the tuition. Extra time. I don't like the subject, and now I have to do some more extra time? It was very unpleasant. But I had to go through that. My parents put me through that, just like you put your children through that. It has to go through that. Then gradually, because the tuition teacher knew how to make me like mathematics, so when he was giving me homework, when he was challenging me, he did it in a way that made me understand and like to do it. His aim was very clear, to remove that, that wrong idea I have, that mathematics is, is, is difficult, it's not fun, it's not easy, all right? But he, made, he, he had an aim to make me like it. And when I understood, I, it became my favorite subject throughout my study life. And I was very good at it. Now, my point about this is, parents, you cannot say my child doesn't like. Which one of you say my child doesn't like this subject? All right, drop the subject. Or let's just don't force the child. You find ways and you think how to make the child like the subject. It's the same with bringing up godly seed. More importantly, when you tell your child this commandment, that commandment, you have to say, my child's heart is not in it. It's doing it, but it is not godly. It has no love for God. His heart is not in it. Now, I have to pray and think. I must do it, but now I need wisdom from God. I need to talk to parents. How do I make my child in obeying God begin to love God? Because that is the purpose of the commandments. That is the purpose of tuition, to make your child understand and therefore grow in love with the subject. That is the purpose of tuition. That is the purpose of the Ten Commandments and the training in the Ten Commandments. Aim at that. 
Don't keep feeling that I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. It's all, and the child is bad. It's not my fault. It's totally your fault. Because God say, I seek godly seed. And he's talking to the parents. Please remember that. And children, of course, you have your responsibility to respond. All right, so the first commandment. Now, Where is it? All right. Let me finish up some more things about the first commandment. Now, how and what decisions you make, how you make decisions, will you make a, God, a seed to become godlier and godlier? So parents, if you notice your child, in your child's heart, God is not supreme. God is not what you will naturally choose first. It used to. What happened? Now, you have to ask, now, when you ask, what do they prefer? Spiritual activities, like reading, praying, talking about God, singing hymns together, memorizing the word, or, or, or it has changed. It doesn't like these things. Prefers, it doesn't prefer this thing. The first commandment is it will prefer God, it will prefer spiritual things, it will prefer things about God above all else. Know the Spirit. It's for yourself too. Then you have to ask now, is it, does that, that change, has it to do with how I've been choosing and making daily decisions that have been subtly inculcating into my child that God don't need to be first? God don't need to be all important. Have I made choices and decisions in that way? I give you an example. Like I said, holidays are not evil, all right? Visiting parents, um, grandparents are not evil. We are expected as Christians um, to, to, uh, to, to love and honor our parents. Now, but the thing is this. When you make those choices, and I speak openly, if it is at a time to go at a time where you know there is a family seminar, you know there is holiday Bible program, you know all these things are specially planned. Even your child heart, they know. But these are family activities. These are activities for, for me. And But yet you make the choice. But you know that period is the best period to travel. You know that period is the best period, this and that. They say, don't worry, child. When, when we come back, we, we watch. We watch together. But you don't, you know. But what I'm saying is this. You are inculcating in your child. You know, many of the child, I want to go. I want to go for holiday Bible program. But daddy and mommy wants to travel. You know how painful it is for me to hear that? Not that I want attendance. It's very painful to hear a child that is in the first commandment now, in their heart. They want to put God first. They love things about God. And yet the parent, without understanding the first commandment, introduced schedules into their life, whether it's swimming, whether it's ECA during the holiday, whatever it is. Your child now begins from a love, a desire to be at those things, and they say that. And I, sometimes I think, if I feel that way, I can't imagine God in heaven. I put a child that has a heart like that in your family and you damage it by making choices unconsciously because you don't realize the spirit of the first commandment is always to have the child want to put God first in everything and definitely anything spiritual, they want it first. Above holiday, above visiting parents, grandparents, above swimming, above everything else. Do you think that it's extreme? Many feel it's extreme because they don't want to face the first commandment. You have no other gods before me. Means nothing else is before me. Nothing else is above me. I'm always first and foremost and always everything to you in your heart. That is the first commandment. That's the spirit. So every decision that you make now, you have to say, what am I subtly sending as a message into my child's heart? Spiritual things are secondary. These physical things, though not sinful, though even important, are still more important than spiritual things. See, your child knows. In their heart, they know. These are things meant for family, for children, but they, are, they want to go away. You see? So, I hope that you take this in the right spirit because it's about cultivating the spirit. Now, let's move on. Um, I have no time for that. 
Now, let's move to the spirit of the second commandment. Second commandment. Now, what is the spirit? It says, Thou shalt not make unto me any graven image, um, nor bow, uh, thou shalt not bow down to serve them, nor ser uh, thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them, for I am a jealous God. Now, here, what is an idol? All right? What's the spirit of the second commandment? So you must understand the spirit. The first one, God is supreme. God always takes priority. Do you make decisions like that for your child? Is your child like that? Number two, the spirit of the second command. Now, love whatever promotes true worship. Hate anything that takes God's place. This is a summary of what the Westminster Confession also says. Hate, love anything that promotes true worship. You, have, you will not bow down to any, you will not serve them, you will not worship them. True worship is in their heart. i explain later. And they hate anything that takes God's place. Now, how do you view the second commandment? This is the attitude of the people in Malachi's time. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor, Will he be pleased with you or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. You see the people say, God, why do you say we don't love you? God, why do you say we don't, we don't worship you? God, why do you say we don't give you, uh, give to you? God, why do you say that? They always ask God, why? Why? Why do you say that? You see, the heart was a, has a severe sickness. God says, now you've offered me blind, and that is what they did. They offered blind animals. They offered lame and sick animals. He said, you try give that to your governor when, when you go and offer some, bring something to, to them. You try and bring it to them. You won't even do that, but you do that to me. Now, what is it? What is God saying about the second commandment? But you have profaned it. He said, the table lot of the Lord is prof, prof, polluted, the fruit thereof, and even the meat is contemptible. God is not important. How we worship God also is not important. You have said, what prophet is it that you have kept his ordinance and, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? Why repent? Why, why must we worship God in this way and be so humble before God when we are wrong? Why must we be, feel so sorry? How they worship God, their attitude towards worship is the problem. They did worship God. Now then you have to ask, my child, when it comes to worshipping God, when I open the Word of God at home, when we sing hymns to God at home, when in church, what is the child's attitude regarding worship of God? That is the spirit we are trying to create. It is not just sit down, sit down, sit down, don't make no sit down, sit down. Yes, but it's, that is not the end. Many parents do that because they don't want the child to embarrass them in church. That is all. The end is child. This is God. We must be reverential. Whenever it is about God, we all keep quiet. We are very reverential. We, we sing, um, the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before Him. Keep silent, keep silent, keep silent. So you must teach the attitude. Then it begins to realize, oh, I'm in the presence of God. Check the attitude, all right? Now, if your child doesn't have a reverential attitude, no matter what you do, the child is not godly. Now, the next one. Hate anything. Hate anything that takes God's place. Now, these people, they happily reserve the best for themselves. They leave the remainder to God. That is their heart. That is how they worship God, all right? So worship is not just Sunday. For them, Saturday. It's throughout the week. What would they keep for God? They keep the best for themselves. They keep for the best to bring to please governors. When you look at a child through the week, is it trying to keep, the Lord say, the best for the Lord? It will work very hard through the week. Is that what your child desires? Your child does it look forward all right, to all this worship. So if it's not, I need to fix it. I need to find out what has gone wrong. What has taken the place of God in my child's heart? 
Now, you come more. Now, if they are unwilling, unwilling worshippers, grudging givers, unwilling servants, they have a heart problem. All right? They have a heart problem. Look at this picture. Which is your child? Teens? I know teens look older than that, I know. What is your attitude when it comes to worshipping God, receiving, singing to God, listening to God's word? Now, parents, when you see your child begin to have their attitude on your right during family worship, during you know what, don't feel very comforted. At least I did my family worship and it's done. Yes, you should do it. Yes, correct. But you must know I am missing the mark. The arrow is not hitting right. The child does not have reverence towards God. So don't have family worship and keep doing family worship when your child has this kind of attitude and just force it through and then it's done. You need to kneel before God and God and pray, Lord, what is wrong with what I am doing? What is wrong with what I'm doing? Now, when I see you like that at worship service or at Bible study, the first thing I ask myself, Lord, what am I doing wrong? That the people have no interest. I am missing the mark. It's the same for you as parents. Right? So, you must cultivate the heart. I share with you, and I hope the teen doesn't mind. The teen came for prayer meeting. Well, now, this is how the teen sits. Right? Cross the leg, lean back. Cross your leg, lean back, and close the eyes and pray. All right? So when I pray with the thing, I say, no, this is not a good sitting position. All right? I'm not just telling you to do an outward thing to sit properly when you pray to God, but these are attitude, external things you do that can change your attitude. All right? The teen had a good spirit. All right? It continued to come for prayer meeting. It put the feet down, and every time I notice, it moved. The body wants to go back to its natural position. <laughs> Is used to position of just crossing the leg and leaning back. Not that he's not paying attention. I, I think he was paying attention. But he, he tr make the changes. Every time he moves, I can see he continue to make the changes. Now, this is the heart, heart of a child that you want to cultivate. Slowly, over time, you realize when I'm before God, I don't sit like I sit before men. I'm very reverential. It is important. You're cultivating a heart. Now, parents... I'm jumping the gun a bit. If your child talks to you sitting like that, you need to change the child. You need to change their attitude, all right? It's a heart, a reverence, a spirit, a spirit. But it is not simply, good, now it's set properly. You really have to do it in a way that the child understands in his heart, all right? Now, Does your child love to be amongst worshippers in worship, in spiritual activities at home? That is the second commandment, all right? Or do they, when God says you shall not bow to other things, serve them? Or do they, is their heart naturally, well, their heart will naturally gravitate towards um, fun and games, it is natural, all right? I'm not saying you create a child that has no interest in anything. But you must always ask, when it comes to the things of God, does it have that kind of delight in it? That is the second commandment, all right? That is the spirit. Now, if your child says, I am bored, during your holidays or when it's coming to church or during Bible studies, you go home and say, how, uh, how, what did you learn? I'm bored, all right? Everything, anything about spiritual things, I'm bored. And they have that kind of attitude, just lean and not interested, I'm bored. Now, again, I say, parents, if you're doing, you can be doing a lot of things, but if that is their spirit, you need to really stop dead in your tracks and not just keep plodding and plodding and plodding on. Yes, you must keep doing it. But you better stop in your tracks and ask yourself, what is wrong now? I need to get the child to be excited about family worship, about church activities, about coming to church to worship God, about singing to God. Maybe you should ask, am I the problem? All right, we come to that at the end. You say, I'm bored. Everything about Christianity, I'm bored. Everything else, I'm not bored. Problem on hand, all right? Now, then it comes back to this, all right? 
Now you need to ask yourself, like I said earlier on, can godly seed grow side by side among the thorns? God talked about the thorns on the, and, the, and the different soil. Now it says, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, Matthew 4, 15, 4, 15. Now, but when they heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their heart. Mark 4, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as they hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts and of other things entering it, entering in, choked the word and it became, becometh unfruitful. Now, it goes back to that same question. When you see your child, very bored and everything, when is this going to be over? What is in their heart? You have to ask, have I introduced thorns in their life? Because their heart cannot flourish among thorns. Now, of course, this passage is talking about unsaved people. So if your child, you keep wondering, why is my child not interested in Christianity? You have to ask, what is at home? What are your choices when you make choices? What are they? What have I introduced and am introducing into their lives that makes them so uninterested? What is choking out their interest in God's word? Now, this has the same effect on the believer's heart as well. We are saved, we have a new heart, but there is the old man, the flesh, that will still struggle against these thorns. Are you introducing thorns? Now, what are you introducing in your child's life? Look at these things. They themselves are not evil. We have hobbies like origami, sports, football, well, um, um, rollerblading, basketball, art, sleep. <laughs> now, these are not evil, all right? These are not evil in themselves. But you have to ask, when I introduce these things, when these things are increasing in their life and I brought it into their life, have, is that the thing that has changed them? Maybe I give you an example. You want your child to have some activity, some sport is very, is very um, inactive, all right? So you introduce basketball to the child, right? Now, over time, you realize that, well, it's becoming more active, healthier. But over time, you realize that suddenly the child is more interested in basketball or whatever it is than the Word of God. Then when it comes to quiet time and all that, he just wants to quickly do it and then run out and play basketball. You know, my neighbor, and ever free time, oh, here, doom. The child, all right? Any free time, he'll be out there. Dum, dum, dum. It's a very young boy, you know, very young boy. One day I just watch. He's, he's incredibly good, super good. He almost like just anyhow flip the ball, it goes into the net. He's that good. Then I talk to the father. The father loves basketball. Right, loves basketball. He wants the child to love basketball. The grandparents came. The grandparents also encouraged the child. Grandparents are always out there watching. And then the neighbor's boy also came over now. <laughs> the neighbor is also always, any free time, out there, basketball. All right? Is it a sinful activity? No. But you have to ask, I introduced this with a good intent. Whatever it is. It could be basketball. It could be a musical instrument. It could be um, um, whatever it is. With a good intent. But... But friends, when you see it has become a thorn, it's become choking the child. Know that your child naturally in their heart will incline to want more and more these things than God's word. You need to then at that time, I introduced this with a good intent, but now it has become an idol. Now I must really seriously consider if I should take it away and stop it. Now I asked a parent once during during um, infant baptism. I say, well, if your child, I say, if you have good aspiration for your child, you want your child to serve in church, all right? And for example, to play the piano or, or that. Now, I say then, so you put your child through, through music classes with a good intent, design your child to be um, able to use that skill. If God willing that one day the child is to serve God in the capacity, then the child has the skill, all right? Now, what happens if over time, and you keep telling your child that this is for you to serve God. If God wants you, then you use it for God, all right? Um, then your child, over time, talks about, loves, 
more interested, would spend more time at the piano than in the Word like you used to. What will you do? I asked the parent. I thank God the parent was very um, clear about the objective. They said, well, if it reaches that stage, then it's an idol. Then I need to stop it. Stop the child. Now, that is why the parent, now, or rather say, when the parent understands the spirit of the Ten Commandments is to cause the child to love God. Even when the child serves God, it's because the child loves God. But anything that I introduce in the child, hoping that it will use it to serve God, but it has become an idol. You must be ready to say, this is not working anymore. The opposite effect has occurred. Now, if at that time, you, your child screams and shouts, why are you taking this away from me? Then you know you have a very big problem on hand. Who caused that? Who introduced that? Not the child. The child has no money to go buy the musical instrument. The child has no money to pay for tuition. You are the one. So you must be always very conscious of the spirit. I'm not against children going through all this at all. But you must be very conscious of the spirit of the Ten Commandments. Once you notice your child is exhibiting the opposite spirit, you must be ready to step in and stop it. And especially when it screams and heals and cries, then you know this is really proven to be an idol in the child's life. And you say, I'd rather have this than go to church. I'd rather have this than do quiet time. I'd rather have this. Then you have to sit down and explain to the child. Until you know how to control this, this has become an idol. All right? And then Imami is helping you to turn back, to return to love God first. You must know how to deal with it. You must be observing. It's not as long as you have done family worship, then it's fine. Watch for idols, right? They, they have begun to worship. Now, um, and another thing I want to say at this point is this. Parents, you can have a picture in your mind about what is a godly seed, but it is not. Give you an example. Some parents have an aspiration for their child to be, well, Sunday school teacher, to be church musician, to be um, some lead leader in the church, all right? So they groom the child. They groom the child, put it through speaking classes. Well, hopefully one day it become a, a teacher in church. They put them through acting classes, all right? They put them through music classes. They put them through all the, They have a picture. And my point is this. Then when they have that skill, they're able to communicate well, they have the skill, they're able to play the piano very well. They have that skill. The parent thinks in their heart, I have achieved the picture, that I have achieved godly seed in my mind, but actually fail to examine that the child actually has many idols in their life. The child is, does not put God as supreme. When it's come to worship, the child is not very interested. When studying God's word, the child is not very interested. Now, maybe we even ask the, the, the adults, are you only coming to church when you are involved in service or because of service? Then you have to ask yourself because God says, you do these things and you ask, for what? Oh, so that I can serve? Okay, I'll come. You achieve the picture, have skills, but actually it's not a godly sin. All right, so I'm just trying to warn you, don't have the wrong idea of what a godly child is and you think if you have these things then i've created a godly seed don't be like that many fall into that fallacy right the deception now then now then the spirit of the second commandment the second commandment now the spirit of the second commandment thou shalt not make any graven eh, i've done this all right uh, i've spoken about this now actually this picture <clears throat> until i came to perth I've never come across and I have never knew that music is a mega thing in this country. Huge. I don't understand. So when I was in Singapore, the mega thing is, well, um, tuition, um, doing, getting this, this degree, that degree, or owning you know, cars. This is, is, is idle. It's mega, mega interest. I thought here there won't be any, but here, so everywhere I turn, it's about music. I say again, we are not against children 
picking up musical instrument. We are not against children taking music classes. But parents, you must not be swept away with that spirit that this is very important. My child must have musical skills. You must ask, why? 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 Has it reached a stage that you introduce that into their life and now all they talk about is that, all they want is that. Then you ask, hey, hang on, why? What has happened to his heart? Is it better for it to have no musical skills when it is such a big thing but it doesn't have, but his heart is preserved? Which one? If your child doesn't have that problem, no problem. But because it's such a mega thing here, in, if I were preaching in Singapore, it would be another thing. So please don't think I'm picking on you and your family. My point is in every place that we go to, there are idols that Satan sets up in that place that are very important. You look at the Old Testament. Different places, Satan will invent different idols that are very important in that land, that idol. The Philistines have theirs. The Amorites have theirs. Certain specific idols in different countries. Today, it's the same. It's just another form. So if you feel that, now that is something that some, it has become an idol in my family, in my child's life. Yes, everyone has it. I'm going to stop it. Are you ready to do that? Because that is the spirit of the first and the second commandment. That is the spirit. No idols. Anything that has become an idol, even if everyone has it, doesn't matter. My child will not have it until it learns not to make it an idol. All right? So I'm not saying that forever you can't. You have to know. You have to guard. That is my point. For adults, you have others. What is your idol? Right? So please don't say, don't think I'm picking on anyone and people should not take music lessons. I'm just saying, watch. Has it become an idol in your child's heart? Has the spirit changed? If it has, who introduced it? We must be honest. All right? Now, there are certain things if your child are involved in things that it's always about competition and performances, be careful. I say again, I'm not saying it is all wrong. But if you find that your child is the kind that loves, that over time, it was a very humble child, very self-effacing child, now is forced to, to perform publicly and to make sure that I am the best. It's always a competition. I've seen children change, I tell you honestly. From children who are very humble, it's not seeking to be great, to change to so competitive that if it doesn't get first place, it hue and cry. Now I'm saying to parents, what I'm saying is you watch. You want to put them through these things? Is the spirit of the first and second commandment changing in their lives? If it is, you must be honest. Don't say, never mind, as long as I bring it to church, it's doing family worship, it's memorizing Bible verses, it's coming for Bible study, it's doing DHW homework. Never mind. You, you must know this is changing your child's spirit. Itself is becoming an idol, all right? So I'm not saying everyone who's in this profession has this problem, but I'm highlighting. It seems to be a unique thing in Perth. So parents, be careful. Spirit of the third commandment is this. Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, when it comes to thou shalt take, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What are you trying to build into your child? that will make it like Christ. Holy profession and answerable conversation for God's glory. This is exact words. Holy profession means a holy witness, a godly witness. Answerable conversation for God's glory. Always concerned about the glory of God. They take the name of Christ on them. Take the name of Christ in vain means I am a Christian. I take the name of Christ. Now, then you have to ask, now, when it comes to my child, is it very concerned about its testimony. Does it care about its testimony? And it also rejects what opposes, what opposes God's truth. There is no hypocrisy. There is no hypocrisy in the child. The child is... Maybe I'll show you this picture first. Where is it? Right. Now, when it comes to the third commandment, the spirit is this. The child is the same person at home, in church, in school, in leisure. The child is the same in his heart. I give you an example. The child doesn't, well, when it comes to church, it's church, so I dress modestly. But when he's going out with his friends, it's a different set of clothes. Now, your child may be 
the most attentive child in church, answer all the questions correctly, does all the homework in church, very good at family worship, but it, is, it has this in the heart. The name of Christ, it doesn't care. It is one, I would dress like that, where is the church? When the outside, I don't care. I would dress differently. Well, teens, are you like that? In church, I will come differently. When it's not church, when it's not among Christian, I dress differently, I talk differently, I behave differently, I play differently. Then you know, hey, hang on. The third commandment spirit is this. I will not take the name of Christ in vain. Means as long as I'm a Christian, I'm Christian everywhere. That is the spirit. So parents, when you begin to notice that your child, hang on, is different. In thoughts, in action, in choices, it's different one place and another. I have a problem. This is not a godly seed. I need to find out what went wrong, what's wrong, and I need to fix it. All right? So that is, that is the spirit of the third commandment. You see, in their, in their attitude towards God, the Malachi people, where God said, I'm seeking godly seed. But why? We are godly. And they say, Malachi 1, 6 to 7, saith the Lord of hosts unto you, priests, you despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread on my altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. You see, that was the attitude towards God. They say, we are priests. But when it comes to worship, this is how they behave. They take the name of God in vain. They don't behave as God expects them to behave. And yet they say, God, what's wrong with me? All right? So now when your child is like that, what's wrong, daddy? Why, why can't I dress like that with my friends? They all dress like that. What's wrong, daddy, mommy? My, all my, my, my friends in Christian school, they're all like that. Why, why must I be different? Now, when you begin to realize that, they say, hang on, in their heart, they, are, they don't have such a strong desire to take the name of Christ and exalt it. They are ready to take the name of Christ in vain. And they say, I have a problem. All right? So that is the spirit. What are you trying to train your child in the third commandment? Not just, I didn't swear. I didn't use Christ's name in vain. It's much more than that. Now, Genuine and highest regard for everything associated with God in name or in deed. A very genuine spirit. Having the highest regard. Always afraid of stumbling others. Always afraid of being a bad testimony. Always afraid of anything that may cause others to follow him or her. They want the name of Christ to be so pure. Is that your child? Or they're always comparing. Are the Christians this? Are the Christians that? Are the Christians this? Are the Christians that? And they say, hang on, I need to now train the spirit of the third commandment into my child. All right? Now, I need to move quickly. Um, now, then the spirit of the fourth commandment, the fourth commandment. This is what the Westminster Confession, larger catechism, try and summarize for us. Now, when it comes to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, God reserves one day for himself, sanctifying and keeping it holy to God one whole day in seven, delighted, delighting to spend the whole day in God's worship. So this is, a, this is the spirit of the, ten, of, the fifth, of the fourth commandment. The spirit of is to ask, is for you to ask, does my child delight to spend the whole day in God's worship, in things related to the worship of God? Does my child have that? Young person, do you have that? Adult, do you have that? No profaning of the day by idleness. Uh, Sunday, I want to sleep. Daddy, I want to sleep. Uh, no, Sunday, I love, I love to can, I can spend a whole day about God's things. Now, needless words, needless works, Needless worldly employments, needless recreation. Is your child having the right spirit in this? On the Lord's day, all right? So child, are you like that? Does your child love the Lord's spending the whole day or they want to spend the rest of their day playing hobbies, going to the park and doing those kind of things? What is in your child's heart when it comes to the Lord's day, all right? 
love one way in the week. What is the spirit? Ask yourself, does my child love that one day in a week where it can spend wholly for God? Although every day, every day is live for God, but this day they really look forward to it. You know, I've seen your children like that. They're so excited about Sundays. They're so excited about coming to church. They're so excited about being able to go to nursing homes. Children can be like that. What is the picture? A child that loves spending the day reading the Bible or reading Christian literature about things that stir and edify their souls. A child that loves to sit down and listen to sermons with you. A child that loves um, to um, pray together with you, to pray for the church. These are things that the child loves. Does your child love that? I think most of us, if we put our hand to our heart, most of our child are not like that. Well, they keep it sufficiently, but the spirit is the whole day. If it is absent, they say, this is still not a godly child yet. You know, you say, ah, it's very difficult. Can children be like that? You know, children, they get very infatuated with superheroes. You know superheroes? They can get very infatuated with superheroes. They can get very, get very preoccupied with superheroes. Many of parents share that with me. The child go to school, come back, acts like Spider-Man, acts like Superman. The girls come back, act like fairies, act like, um, you know, some Disney character. I want to be a princess and all that. And then when it comes to, well, um, holidays, right? They want to go to Disneyland, what's the other one? Um, Universal Studio. Their friends talk about it. You tell them to spend the whole day, they will tell you, not enough. Can we spend the whole week? You think children's heart cannot be cultivated to love something, some character, so much that it would say, I love to just spend the whole day about this person, about this thing. They can spend the whole day watching um, Superman for the boys or whatever, whoever you, you can you think of. Uh, for the girls, no, it's Barbie, right? <laughs> this big Barbie movie, I don't know what it's about, but Barbie, I see pictures of it. They can talk about it, they can want to go and see the life um, simulation of it, all that kind of things. Now, what I'm trying to say is this. Your child's heart can be tuned to love someone, something so much that even when on holidays, that is the thing, that is the person, that is the place he wants to be at. It's possible, absolutely possible. But the question is, what have you introduced into their lives? What happens during holidays? i ask you again, what happened during holidays? Holidays are not evil. But parents, if once you understand the spirit of the Ten Commandments, you are very careful not to introduce idols into their life. You're very careful not to introduce things that you know they will struggle with. You're very careful to introduce things that they don't need to be introduced to, even though they may not, they may not be sinful, because they are already struggling with many things. So when you go on holidays, and you know that your child's heart is gravitating towards this thing, husband and wives, sit down, look at the itinerary and say, what will we do on Sunday even though when we are on holidays? Because what you're inculcating into them about the Lord's Day, the strongest message is when you are on holiday. We are on holiday, it's an exception. Holiday from God too. They are going to grow up breaking the fourth commandment. Breaking the fourth commandment in spirit is not delightful. The fourth commandment is always delighting. You will call this day your delight. Delighting in that day that you can spend in the presence of God. That you love being in the presence of God. Now I would say that the fourth commandment, the spirit of the fourth commandment encapsulates, summarizes and proves the first to the third commandment in your child's heart. Because the fourth commandment is when the child says in his heart, on this day, I can do everything that is related to the first to the third commandment. 
Any, everything about the first to the third commandment is what I delight in and I can do it the whole day on Sunday. That is what you're trying to inculcate into your child's heart. So parents sit down and say, this is the Lord's day. What are we going to plan? How what are we going to do? Then you look at the rest of your holiday. I know you will go on holiday and it's not sinful. And I'm trying to help you inculcate, nurture a godly seed wherever they are and not introduce things through holidays into their lives that you will regret later. That is what I'm doing, all right? I'm not, for a moment, say don't go on holidays. I'm trying to help you nurture consciously areas that you may have overlooked. When you plan your schedule to go anywhere, whether it's holiday or whether it's in Perth, when it's on it's school holidays, whenever you plan in the husband and wife sit down and say, we are planning to go to this place and that place. Hang on, let's ask ourselves, first to, first to, fifth, first to fifth commandment, does it break any of it? Does it cause them to be weaker in their desire for the first to the fifth commandment if we brought them to these places, if we showed them these things, if we did these things, ask yourself. And even if we can bring them there, ask yourself, what are the areas we are going to shield them from? Now, are we being cults? Should we also wear black and white and go on holidays? I'm not saying that, all right? You need to know you are nurturer. You are the nurturing person. I showed the picture of the seedling. What do you do? You know that you can bring it out to the, to, to the externals. But you know for this plant, you cannot expose it to direct sunlight. You put it under shade. You bring it out, yes. But you are very conscious where to put it in order not for it to be destroyed. That is the heart of the parent in bringing up nurturing godly seed. You must be constantly conscious of the spirit. I am trying to make the child love God, not have idols, love being in the presence of God. Now, sometimes I see, um, and it's common, all right? We go on holidays. I made that mistake myself many times. And now when I begin to understand these things, I feel so sorry that I put up those pictures, all right? On, on Facebook or whatever. We go to temples. Japan is a big thing now, right? Everybody's going to Japan. Yen is weak. Long time people didn't go to Japan. So people are flocking to Japan. When they go to Japan, you see, you see Christians, they go visit temples, right? Why? They pick, take picture of temples, all right? And they put it up. They want to dress in a certain way and they hug tombstones and all that. Now, just because your unbelieving relatives do all that, you must think, if I bring my child and I expose them to this, what am I teaching them? You want to bring them to temples? You bring them there and you tell them, these are idols. You see how wicked they are? These are places that people, that Satan invented. You don't bring them there and make it look like a holiday place and this is the place and take photographs and post it everywhere. You don't. Let me take you back to the Jews. This is equivalent and you look at it and you hear this, you may balk. This is equivalent to the Jew going to the idol temples, and then, then no photographs, right? Then get someone to paint and draw, and then bring it home and post it on their wall. You say, what, this terrible juice, you balk at it. But that is what we do. We don't think. You are introducing to the child temples of the devil are not to be angry. You, there is no anger against them. You must train the child to have that kind of, remember what is the, what is the um, second commandment? A hatred for anything that is against God. So parents, what I'm saying is this. Be very conscious of what you are nurturing and exposing your child to. All right? You bring them to places, you expose them to things. Now, are you now making them more and more, have a lower and lower and lower desire in view of the Sabbath day? You have to ask yourself that. All right, so, so the Sabbath day, I used the example earlier on, right? Now, your child is not very interested in God and seems to be breaking the first to the fourth commandment's spirit, the first to third commandment's spirit. 
Do you realize, parents, that that the Lord's Day, the whole Sunday, is your best day to fix that in your child? I gave you the example, right? Now, your child, for example, your child doesn't like to exercise. Then you set one day. You say every Saturday afternoon or morning, right? Daddy is going to take you to to play this game over. And then you you spend the day trying to get your child in excited about something for his good, for his health or whatever. You do that because, you know, if I can spend more and more time doing this with the child and try and get the child interested, and then the child will, will slowly develop an interest. That is called the Lord's Day. Why do you think the Lord set apart one day and tell you don't work, don't worry about work, set and be with me? It's to cultivate love for Christ, cultivate love for Him. Why do husband and wife say it's our anniversary? Let's take leave. Let's spend the day together. Why do you do that? To renew our love, all right? You know that that is important, all right? To refresh our love for one another. You know that spending that one day can do wonders, correct? So, please understand the spirit. Your child loves that one day. Look, loves to say, I don't have to do homework, not because it's lazy, but I can just spend this day on spiritual things reading autobiographies, reading the Bible, listening to Bible stories. Teens, you say, my parents are not, are not believers or my parents don't care. What do you do? You do it yourself. That's the spirit. I love this day. Your child hate the Lord's day. Now, the spirit of the fifth commandment, last one, the spirit of the, let me see, yeah. the spirit of the fifth commandment. Honour thy father and thy mother. Now, Westminster Larger Catechism describes it as honour of all superiors in age and gifts, especially those that are over us in place of authority in family, church or government. When is your child's spirit towards authority? Authority, your authority at home, the family. The authorities in church, the authorities in the country. This is the fifth commandment. What is their spirit? And it's about well, um, duties mutually owed in our relations means the same for father towards the child. We talk about that after. Reverence in heart, word behavior, willing obedience and submission to corrections, duties of equal, and so on, right? But remember, reverence in heart, word and behavior towards authorities. There is a reverence in the heart. There's a reverence in the way they speak to authorities. There is a willing submission to their correction. Is that a spirit in your child or is it a rebellious spirit? Now, I say again, parents, this is where the problem is. Our child comes to church. Our child, I conduct family worship. Our child has memory verses. Our child does Sunday school homework and DHW homework. But the moment you sense in your child a rebellious spirit against you. And they will get into that stage, that age. And teens, if you are at the age where you say, all my friends say at this age we are rebellious. It is okay. It is not okay. You you are foregoing the spirit of the fifth commandment. The spirit of the fifth commandment, regardless of whether your teen friends are rebellious, you are always respectful, reverential, obedient, and when are corrected, you willingly submit and say, who are you to tell me this? How dare you say this? You don't understand me. No, it's a willing obedience to corrections. All right? So now parents, if you see that is, that is missing, honour is missing. The children of Israel during Malachi's time, God asked them, a son honoureth his father and a servant honoureth his master. A servant his master. If I then be a father where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? The children of Israel went to the temple. They gave offerings. They even asked God, why, why do you say we did not give you offerings? Why are you rejecting our offerings? They did everything by the book. But God says, you, yeah, you do these things, but there's no honor to me. Christ honors the Father to the point of going to the cross to die. That is the honour of the Son to the Father. He is God. 
So when you see, wait, I want to train my child to honor, then look at Christ. They say, I want my child to be like Christ when it comes to honoring authorities. Now, if you cannot honor your parents and those you can see, you are indebted to, now how are you going to honor the invisible God? I always say this. At this point, I will say this. Why does God put this commandment in there? Why? Because your child at that young age cannot see, cannot touch God, and God will put you as the model in there. And God will use you to train and to teach your child honour. Until your child learns to honour you, it will not learn to honour when it grows up the invisible God. So parents, if your child is not one that is honouring you, no matter what you do, you have a problem on hand. So the spirit of the fifth commandment, I honour authorities that God, I honor, the authorities of God, my Father has put over me. The authorities that God, my Father, my Heavenly Father has put over me, I honour. I show you this picture now. This is the one that I want to get to. Who is the God in your family? Who is served, loved, and adored most? I ask you this. Parents, you can do all the right things with your child biblically, but if you're someone who is nurturing your child wrongly, this is the picture. Your child is actually the God at home. Activities, schedule, preferences revolves around your child. You are bringing up a child that makes itself feel that I am the one that should be honoured. I'm the one that should be honoured. I'm the one that should be adored, not God. You are building your child into that. Parents, I understand, you love your child. I mean, many of a child are very adorable. Even when I see your child, I, I want to pinch them, carry them, all right? I don't because people say, what pastor carry the other child, not my child. So even if I carry a child, I have to do it in secret, right? Even if I say, oh, I think pastor doesn't like our family. Pastor doesn't like our child. It's not that. Your child are very adorable, all right? Um, I think if I've, I've, I've children like yours, I might spoil them too. <laughs> I say honestly. But that is our problem. We spoil our children. You can bring it, you can do all the biblical things that are outwardly right about a, what a Christian should do. But this big problem, the fifth one, the fifth one, I say the fourth proves your child's heart for one to three. The fifth the fifth one. Now, the fifth one is the one where you have full control to ensure that one to four happens. But instead, we spoil our child. We spoil our child because of wrong love. Child, you don't go to church, it's okay. Child, you don't want to do quite that, it's okay. Child, you want to eat this, uh, daddy, mommy, never mind, you, you, you eat first. The next picture. Now, who adores most? Mom. Who does your husband adore most? God or the daughter? Some of that always closer to the daughter, right? Am I right? I don't know. I think so. Who does mom adores most? The, do the son. Is it typical? Oh, all right, T the other way. But my point is this. When you do that, that they see they are even more important than God, you adore them so much. I'm not saying don't adore them. Eh? You're supposed to love them, cherish them. But when they see that they become so important, they hate as well. Be careful of the spirit you're building. Familiar picture, parents? Who is most honoured and feared at home? Who? Don't say that. The kid will get angry. Don't ask the kid to do housework. The kid will pout like that. Now, I've seen before where, you know, COVID-19 period, we had to do cleaning, right? COVID-19 period. And sometimes I observe the children. Now, those who are not honoured at home, <laughs> they just do it. Clean, they clean. Dirty, they clean. They squat down. They... But those that are most honoured at home and feared at home, probably not asked to do anything. They pout. They are upset. They literally just throw the cloth there. And I've seen parents take over. 
that is a very serious problem of the spirit of commandment number five. There's no honor to authorities. It has been brought up so spoiled that I, who, who, how you, dare you ask me to clean? Even, I don't even do cleaning at home. Yes, 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 don't, don't, don't get my kid to clean. I will clean for my kid. Now, parents, don't love your child wrongly. Don't. Teach them to honor you. Now, children, you want to be a godly seed? This is the most difficult part for you, especially when you become a teen. You agree? If you're honest, you will. Honoring your parents is the most difficult. Now you learn, I want to be a godly seed, then this is the spirit that God says, honor father and mother. If Christ, my Savior, honor God the Father to the point where God the Father says, go and die for these people and redeem them, Christ willingly, quickly was ready to fulfill it and fulfilled it. To the dot, my meat is to do the will of the Father and to finish it because he honored the Father. That is godly seed. All right? Now, if your child gets away as long as it pouts, as long as it gets upset, gets mad, as long as it retaliates, scream, shout, hit you. Now, if your child is like that even from a young age, remember the spirit, parents, God put you in charge to build a spirit. And the fifth commandment when God asks the child to honour you is to give you the authority to make sure you do something about it, not leave them alone. All right? So remember that. Now, um, I asked a parent for permission to share this, and the parent said, go ahead. Now, sometimes when you eat, I'm talking about a spirit, all right? A spirit. And I'm giving examples because I need to help you relate it, all right? Not to point out and make fun of people. Sometimes when we eat, we let our child eat first, all right? Child, what do you want to eat? All right, you eat, and then the remainder, you, know, you don't want this? Okay, then daddy and mommy eat. Now, it may be very common in, 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 in our culture, but you are imbibing the wrong spirit without realizing it, all right? So thankfully, I spoke to this parent and immediately I said, yeah, Pastor, I didn't see it that way. Thanks for telling me. At least now I better go home and correct it. All right? So now when you do that, you're teaching your child, you are the most honored person, the most important person at home. It will grow up expecting that. Honor God. Why honor God? I'm the most important person. You know, Christ showed the example at the Last, at the last Supper, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. He dipped the soap and he gave it to Judas first. We know what it means, right? At that meal, all right, the one who is given the honor to start first is the honored guest. Eating is like that in the, in the Oriental culture. So Christ loved Judas so much. He wanted even to show you, I love you. Why do you want to betray me? Why do you want to reject me? The starting first is a place of honor. It is a fact. So when you begin to do those things without thinking, you are imbibing the wrong spirit. Just Sunday, right? A group of us was just talking behind. Thank God these days when we talk behind, it's not scolding me, right? It's good conversations. All right? Someone said, you know, during my time, during our time, we don't start to eat until dad sits at the table. And even when dad sits at the table, we still don't get to eat until dad takes his chopstick and takes the first food and puts it on his plate or gives to one of us, then the rest of us can start eating. Now, that was exactly the kind of environment we grew up in. What has happened to that? Today, you see, you see, sit down, child eats first, child takes everything, then the parent eat. The child grow, grow up. Don't blame the child, all right? Blame ourselves. We are the one that built this mentality in the child. They are the honored one. Not the other way around. Honor thy father and thy mother. These are small things. There are many other things, all right? I'm citing them as small things to help you think of the spirit of honoring you. They don't honor you because you spoil them, because you love them wrongly. You want them to have what you didn't have when you are young. 
Then you must remember the spirit of the fifth commandment is exactly the opposite. All right? Please remember that. So these are little things that, that we build in when it comes to church meals. I announce those with children in arms and the elderly, the elderly first, then the children with children in arms next. And I always say, I'm talking about children in arms. Means literally, wait, hang on. Can you carry, uh, you can carry um, Stephen at this age, right? Would you consider Stephen as children in arms? No, because the child can walk already. The child can move around. Now, why do we do that? I wish I explained last time. Right now, this is to train. As long as the, the child can learn already, is elderly first. Even if I'm in arm, they visually see it's always elderly first. Honor. We are building attitudes. Remember that. Not morality. Attitudes that will change when they grow up in their attitude towards God. It's natural. That is how they will behave. It will always be God first, God most important, God is everything. They won't argue with that because of the honor built, the, the mentality of honoring authorities is built in them. Now, then for those that are younger, they can walk, they will see, I am not important. Just because I'm a child, I, it doesn't surround me. Adults first, elderly, adults with child in arm, then me. Now, all these things are to build into them the fifth commandment. I don't do these things randomly um, and I'm just afraid that hot food spill on the children. Yes, those, those are our concerns. So, I get very concerned when, 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 when children knock my arm and you begin to... Now, so adults, please don't do this. Huh? Don't go around, ah, yeah, never mind, your, your children are still small. Cut, 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 kill, cut, kill. Don't do that. We are building something in their hearts. And the children here, oh, never mind, okay, I can just overtake adults. They are not important. Adults, authorities are important. They are authorities. Honour them. Build this in their hearts. So sometimes I have to stop you. Hey, you know, we do this for a reason. Why do you tell them to cut queue? Right? Don't do that. And parents, if you have children like that, tell them, you know, wait, it's not your turn yet. Build them into them. Now, am I being pedantic? But what I'm trying to tell you is this. Everything is about a spirit. Be started by the renewing of the spirit of the mind. The attitude is what the Ten Commandments is building into us. An attitude of love and honour towards God is what it is. All right? So I hope that you understand that. I have no time now. Um, I'll just, just give you an example. Christ, God, in the flesh on earth. And he, which is Christ, went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. See, even Christ, and he know I am God. Christ did not say, I am God, you know. You expect me to be subject myself to you? No, he still subjected himself to Joseph and Mary. He showed the example of the fifth commandment. Who is your child that should feel so important and so honoured? When Christ showed the example, say, I want my child to be Christ-like, build that into them. Right, honouring um, authorities, which is you, for example. Now, um, so my last question to you is this: Right, so we maybe about ten minutes over time. So please bear with me. Are you as parents godly seed? Now this is the twist. I ask you, what is the picture of a godly seed? Then, as parents, you say, yes, I want my child to listen to this. You listen to all the spirit about the Ten Commandments. You have to ask yourself, are you a godly seed? You want to bring up godly seed for the next generation. Why? So that they will be serving God and useful to God. You are supposed to be serving God and useful to God. Then you, whatever age you are, is actually part of godly seed in the church. So now parents, you have to ask yourself, am I a godly seed? I'm trying to bring up godly seed. The fifth commandment is this, and I hope you understand. The fifth commandment, when God asks your children to honour you, God is saying, what they tell you, whether in word or deed, honour and follow. As long as it's not unbiblical, of course. Honour and follow. 
you are their model of godliness. Parents, you are their model of godliness. They see you as what a godly seed should be. That is why God says, honour your father and your mother. Because they are your models of godly seed. So parents, you must not look at all this and keep saying your child must do this, your child must do that. You must be that first and foremost. Who influences the godly seed the most? You, not church. Now the home must be the most godliest, must be the godliest spiritual environment there is. This is why we're covering this in Husband's Fellowship. I know parents, you want to send your children to Christian schools. We are not against that. But I hope you don't have this idea. If I send them to Christian school, I will put them in a godly environment. And then there is a higher chance of them to become godlier. There may be some truth to that, but as parents who have sent your children to Christian school, you know it's not necessarily so. But you know, the danger that we can fall into as parents is this. We forget, actually, the place that makes the greatest difference to nurturing your child into a godly seed is actually your home. It's actually you at home. The danger is you send them to Christian school, you think they fix some of the things for you. Do you know the, the environment that can create the greatest impact on them to be godly Christians is not a Christian school. It is your home. And your home is what you do at home. That is where they learn the most. You must be that godly seed example to them. Your godly seed will learn to love what you love. Honour what you esteem. All right? If they see that, well, certain things are very important to you, you, you take part in it, you, you spend time and energy in it, and you talk about it, it's something, well, it's something that you love, they will likely grow up to love that and take it to another extent. What you honour, what you esteem, I'm not saying graduating, I'm not saying exercises are bad, but when you talk to them, like, it's so important. See, so and so oh, so smart. So and so graduated so smart. Watch how you say things. Education is not evil. I'm not saying girls cannot be educated. That's why I purposely chose girls. All right? People, some things that, oh, churches that teach women should not be pastors are against women being educated. It's totally wrong. All right? But what you honor as in education, position, success, being part of the workforce, you esteem that. They will, they will esteem that. You are the godly seed picture to them. Dad, how, how, what you do, how you do things, how you dress, what's important to you, what you pursue, they will watch. They will follow. They will aspire to be because to some extent they do honour you. If that is important, then that must be important in life. What you value, your godly seed will learn, will value, right? You're obsessed with beauty. Now, we answered teens Q&A question. Is it wrong to put makeup? We answered that. It is not wrong. Now, is the extent and the obsession to it and why you do it that you must check? Now, but if you have an obsession with all this, your child will grow up to be very obsessed with looks. They will think looks are very important and very important for life. I'm not saying then you'll be as ugly as you can be, all right? But it's what you show them, what you get them interested in. Constantly painting, painting, and always just, just fretting over those things. And then it's like, come, come, let's go to, you know, this salon to paint, paint, paint kind of thing. Let's go together. Watch. What are you building in them? All right? You want godly seed? Then you have to begin to examine these things. Your godly seed will learn the picture. Have you seen this? Very common. And people post it on the internet and think it's very cute. Mothers keep putting makeup and then they, will, they show the child all, 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 all messed up. But the truth is this. They emulate you. Are you a godly seed? You know, the worst sin that you can commit is say, I want to bring up godly seed. I want them to honour me. But you show the worst example. Alright? So, your children see 
what you do, who you are, when you're not in church. Church don't. Church is not the place where it's the best place for them to learn godliness. It is one of the places, but the best place is the home because of you. They hear what we don't hear, right? We don't hear what you say at home, but they hear, they listen, and they be, it becomes their value. So are you a godly seed yourself? You, what you are as parents will mold them more than what you say or even do. Remember that. I'm sure you know that. Notice what Christ say, John 5, 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Means please pay attention. The son can do nothing of himself, but he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. Christ is saying, I honour the father. And I do my, my picture of who I follow, he's God, you know, is what I see the Father do, whatsoever thing he's doeth, these things also doeth the Son likewise. Now you say you want to build a godly child like Christ. Your child will do what you do. So what kind of father are you? And children, God does want you to follow what your parents who are godly do. All right? Christ set the example. Now, last, last few things. Your family will be the model. Now, here is where I want parents to realize this. What kind of family your child will likely have when they grow up will be very much, very close to the model that you show them yourself. What kind of parenting, what kind of um, relationship, what kind of choices you make, they will grow up following the same. Now, very often people ask me this. You know, Pastor, I, I know you, this and that, but, but we all turn out all right. Or that family, yes, they did that, but they all turn out all right. Now, what is the answer that we should give? Just because everyone turned out all right, then it is fine. It's the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God that things didn't go wrong in that family. There are tons of others that when they disobey God, when their children grow up, they were good, they were fine. What happened? They are so wayward now. You have to think of those. The mercies of God. You must not take the mercies of God and turn it into a norm. Christ, uh, the Bible says, shall we sin that grace may abound? So don't use that and say, they turn out alright, these turn out alright, then they disobeyed well. Maybe I put it this way. Satan is looking for poster boys. You know what that means? Satan is always looking for success stories to promote what he wants you to do. So Satan will, will be happy, will be glad that these families turn out right when these families dishonor God and follow what he wants them to do. He is the happiest one. Because why? The next family will use this as success stories. They're not meant to be that. Don't make yourself a success story for Satan. Parents, don't. Because there will be families, there will be children that will follow. Now I go back to the third commandment. Are you a godly seed, parents? The third commandment, the spirit is, I am so jealous for the name of Christ. I am so jealous for the holiness of God and I, want, I do not want to stumble anyone. Which is why Paul said, if meat caused my brethren to stumble, I will not eat meat for the rest of my life. Why? He is so concerned about the brethren thinking that meat means something and they will now begin to feel that the idols are something. You are so concerned that even you know it is fine for yourself, but this is going to stumble someone. The third commandment spirit is so strong in you. You say, I will not stumble my children. I do not want them to grow up to even do something that it's not the best. I'd rather not. I'd rather not do, spend my Sundays like that. I'd rather not make these choices and that. So, parents, you are your child's model. They will grow up modeling after you. Don't take others who turn out fine as your model picture. They are just Satan's success stories. 
not God's. That, what is your spirit? Computer games, you also play? You go home, that's what you're obsessed with? Or what other hobbies is it? You know. The child knows that you're obsessed with it. They will grow up with the same spirit. Right? They will have idols. And I said this before, you drink, they drink. They find it's fine. Total abstinence is false. They won't want to listen. That is wrong. Now, there's, this, there's always no need to be so strict. No need to be so strict. We can be flexible. We need to be flexible. Should we be flexible? A parent was very upset and challenged me and said, when it comes to the Ten Commandments, we need to be flexible, especially the Fourth Commandment, all right? Now, I hope that the parent understands the spirit of the commandments. See, the fourth commandment is to help you and your child to grow in love for God. And if you as a wife say, we should be flexible, how would you respond if your husband tells you? When it comes to the seventh commandment, wife, we should be flexible when he commits adultery. There should be exceptions. How are you going to answer? You see the spirit that you're building into your child? We can choose and pick and be flexible. God is not supreme to be loved, adored, followed with our love without exception. You'll begin to build that into your child. Why not build that into your husband? You see, that is our heart. We don't understand the spirit and we make wrong choices. Now, lastly, last three minutes, to the young ones, you are present. God has set you apart. The Lord covenants with you as well. All right? He is a faithful God. Now, children, I want to say this to you. Don't look at your parents and say, yeah, daddy and mommy were not good examples and therefore it's their fault. Now, if your parents are godly examples, young ones, Treasure it. Obey them. Honour them. Follow them. All right? Do that. If your parents are not godly examples, you still say in your heart, Lord, I want to be a godly seed. And when I grow up, I want to be a godly example to my children. All right? Don't get discouraged and give up. Come on your own. Yeah, they may not come. They may not want to come. You come. Because you say, I want to be a godly seed. They have no interest in these things to say, I will show the way. I want to be a godly example at home. You can be. All right? Don't blame environment. Now, voluntary obedience to God's will. Young child, you say, I want to be like Christ. I want to be godly. Now, let's read this together. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down by my, of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Christ, the Son of God, teaches us, the sons of God, about love to God as a godly son. Say, when it comes to, even when I comes to my life, no one forces me. No one can force me. I am God. But say, because God the Father commanded that I go and die for you. I take the commandment and I go do it. That is what is Christ's life. As long as it's a commandment from God the Father, He does it even if it will cost His life. That is His love for His Father. Now, I close with this example and then we finish. I promise. <laughs> I know you're hungry. Now, I, I said when I was on the plane back to Singapore, I watched some documentaries to understand um, how people think, even unbelievers, when it comes to their parents. For those of you who are Singaporeans, you know of a very famous Nasi Lemak store in Bukit Timah Hawker Centre. Well, I'm not encouraging you to go there. Very famous, all right? Extremely famous. And any time, it's a super long queue, 
all right? Um, Malay rice with chicken, with coconut rice, with chili, that kind of thing. Very long queue, any time. So it became a famous success story, and um, they interviewed this person, and of course put it on Singapore Airlines for people to know success stories in Singapore. Now this man, when interviewed, he said, you know, from young, I had to help my dad in this hawker store. It's hot, it's dirty, it's tiring. After school, I have to go and help him. From young, I really didn't like it. But my dad says, this is what I want you to do. So I went. I said, wow. Now, it's, I think, Malay or Indian or mixed. That culture, they, they have a very strong sense of obedience and reverence towards their parents. Now, so he said, and always in his say, when my dad passes away, I will get out of this business. I can't wait to get out of this business. Then he clarified, not that I want my father to die, but I know one day he will pass away and that is when I'll stop doing this. And he was a fully grown adult man with grown up children. But all the while, he still fulfilled his father's desire to, to do that business. Then the father was dying. And he said, when the father was on his deathbed, he was so sad. He said, I didn't want to lose my father. He loves his father so much. He said, I don't want to lose my father. Then at his dead side, he said, asked his dad, Dad, what do you want me to do? Anything, just name it, I'll do it. That is his love for his father. I want to do something. I just want to do what you want me to do. That is love. Tell me, just tell me. Then the father said, make sure the business continues. And I said, oh, his heart sunk. Not just that. Make sure the business grows. <laughs> what? He said he really was in his heart. He said, no, <laughs> anything but that, right? He waited all his adult life. Children like to adult. But with tears in his eyes, he said, Dad, is that really what you want? He said, yes. Don't let the business end, but grow it. He said, Dad, I will promise you that. All right? He walked away and said, how am I going to do this? I don't like this. And to grow it? Well, he engaged some people, a partner, and then they began to figure out. He kept his promise. He kept not just to run the business in that, in that hawker center. He kept his promise to grow it. The father is dead, but he kept his promise. The father, the, to honor the father was so important in this life. If I said this to my father, I will do it. If that is what my father's heart desire. Even if it's not around to see it, I will do it. And now it's grown to multiple places, right? Mega business. Not that he loves the business, but he did it simply because he made a promise out of love and honor to his father. Adults, this is the meaning of the first Ten Commandments. Children, teens, this is the meaning of a godly seed. That you honor and love your father in heaven so much. Like Christ say, this commandment have I received of my father, even if it means to go and die and suffer terribly, I will go and do it. Because this is what my father wants. That is the spirit of the Ten Commandments. That is everything that you do from bringing them to church, family, worship, teaching them God's word, praying with them, making them attend Sunday school, attend DHW, uh, um, um, Bible holiday program, church camp, everything that you do, is to build this in their heart. Pray for wisdom. Everything that you do, do it with the aim. If it's not working, pray. If it is not happening, please be honest and admit, my child is not a godly seed. I cannot just keep doing this and pretend like, a, like an ostrich, put my head in the ground, all is fine. I need to now be serious. Young ones, you don't need your parents to keep telling you. They tell you once, it's a commandment. Christ just, the Father said, this commandment I receive of the Father, I will go and do it. That is godly seed, like Christ. Let us pray. What do we have here? Top five reasons why church dropouts, uh, what church dropouts say, why they stop attending church. Now, please remember 66% of, well, I take the American view, um, they are the most readily available results. They stopped attending church at least a year after turning 18. So from